are now going to have a discussion between our last two guests, Anthea and Aisha. There's some beautiful overlaps between your two talks, the sort of the idea of the entangled activism and how activists are really sort of playing out a lot of the problems that they're seeing and trying to fix. And then, Aisha, your beautiful phrase about moral superiority. Um, can you repeat it? The culture is replacing compassion uh, with moral superiority, I guess. Yeah, the idea of compassion replaced replace with moral superiority. Yeah. And I would love, I mean, you've both been listening to each other's talks. I'd love to make myself irrelevant as a, <laughs> as a mediator. Um, and whether you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas that were sparked by each other's talks. And then we'll, I'll maybe kind of interject during it um, and kind of put in a couple of couple of ideas if they come up or any common themes. But would either of you like to start with a question for the other? Um, yeah, okay, I will start. Um, you know, I think writing a book like yours is, I think can be nerve wracking. I think it can be a nerve wracking challenge right now because, you know, we do think in quite black and white terms in, you know, literally and metaphorically. And so I wonder, you know, did you face much resistance writing it? How was the process where you, maybe what I wanna ask, because something I get the general sense of is that people feel a lot of fear when it comes to being honest about the problems that they're observing in the world now when uh, some of these problems are coming from self-described good people. So yeah, did you feel some fear? Yeah, thanks. I. I felt vast amounts of fear writing this. So it's a reflection on my own experiences as a campaigner, as well as interviews with dozens of other campaigners, some of whom had done similar kind of work to me, some of whom came from very different backgrounds and had done very different things. And the first, the first form of fear was, um, should I be criticizing activism when this work does matter? Because I think it's very easy, and there are lots of conversations where people are criticizing activists for good reason. There are, there are criticisms to make, but leaving out the broader picture that we are in climate and biodiversity crisis, we're in political breakdown, the people in charge are not getting to grips with it, people are not empowered to act. You know, there are multiple problems, we don't need to enumerate them here. And, and people power, in some ways, does work. Yeah and has worked, and arguably is the only thing that ever has worked. Yeah. So I didn't want to be giving ammunition to the other side in looking at the, the shadow side of activism. That felt really alarming. And then I went through this whole kind of thought process and talking to people and realized, well, hold on, everyone else can see it already. <laughs> they can already see we're being hypocritical and righteous and controlling. We're the last people to be looking at this, so it's about time. And also this idea that we shouldn't be looking at our inner lives, because these questions do lead us into our inner lives, because the problems are so urgent. Mm. Well, again, we're the last people to be looking at our inner lives. The advertisers have been using the insights of Freud for more than a century to sell us shit. Mm -hmm. Neoliberalism, the political and economic project we're in now, is arguably a total remaking of the self, but a lot of us don't realize it's happening. You know, it's about yeah. time those of us trying to change things looked at all of this. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, and I wonder because you mentioned the shadow. Um, who, is everyone familiar with the concept of the shadow, like the Jungian idea? I mean, I guess, it, I guess it's been popularized over the last few years. And I know it's another interest that, that yeah. you've had. We talked about when we first did the interview. Yeah, for um, sure. So I wonder if there's a kind of common thread there to pick up on. Yeah, well, I, I guess, um, you know, when I first started conceptualizing a shadow in my own mind before, before coming across Jungian's work because I think when I went through my own experience that was very transformational. Part of what made me interested in, let me call it the basement, I mean our own basement of horrors, if you like. Part of what allowed Should me- Should we just say what the shadow is just so everyone's on the same? Okay, so I, the, I forgot to- yeah. So I, well, I imagine, or I mean, you might have a, a, a clearer articulation of it, but I see the shadow as our, our subconscious. You know, what is in, what is hidden in our subconscious that's maybe our darker matter. I don't know if that would be a, a way to describe it. So we all have a shadow. So this is things that we are not conscious of, but do inform our behaviors either way. And so our shadow might be informed by things that have happened to us as children. It might be informed by things that we don't want to look at because we've 
assign some value judgment to them. Um, but the problem is when you don't acknowledge what's in your shadow, and we all have one, um, these things, they build and they nurture themselves and they come out, they leak into your, your good deeds um, in the world. Um, and so that's why I've always been interested in the shadow, mostly because when I went through my own transformation, I realized I was not what I thought of myself. And some of that was not quite positive. And I think when I saw that side of myself, it was very unsolicited. I wasn't trying to be self-reflective at that time. Uh, but when you see yourself in a, in a new light that isn't quite flattering, if you're interested, you can't help but act on that. You know, if it means something to you, you can't help but act on it. And if you're really looking at shadow, I think it's ugly enough that it's automatic. You know, I don't even think it's... Uh, because in many ways, if I'd have known what was to come after that was to come, I probably wouldn't have chosen to look into it. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I think it's something that's out of our control once you recognize it. And, and I would very much say that it, it seems like... You know, we're very, and I wonder what you think. I ask everybody who's aware of the shadow concept, like, because I, you know, I'm, I don't know. Why are we so scared of the shadow? Why are, because I find it weird in the sense that everybody acknowledges that they're imperfect people. So we all know that on one hand, that we're not perfect people. Everybody would admit that they have flaws, but no one believes that they have, um, I don't know, people aren't, people don't self-reflect to that degree. And what, and what is that, do you think? I think of this as sort of the, um, the difference between known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, so the known unknowns are the bits that we like, yeah, okay, we know about that. I know I'm a flawed person. I know I do this. You know, it's like that annoying question in job interviews. It's like, well, what's your, you know, what's your worst characteristic? And you're like, oh, I work far too hard. You know, all that nonsense. Whereas the, un the shadow, what we're talking about here is the unknown unknowns. And when we don't know what something, you know, we like to know. It's this is here be monsters territory. You know, and the whole purpose of, of all sorts of thera psychotherapeutic interventions, arguably, you know, in the broadest sense, they've all got different approaches, is to bring into the light those things so that we're no longer scared of them and they're no longer driving us in ways that, in ways that we can't do. Now, this is tricky, isn't it? Because we can't be sitting here advocating therapy for everyone because it's, it's expensive and it's not available and, and that's a problem. But I think we can encourage a more reflective culture and a culture that isn't in its very terms of discourse, putting the problem always onto other people. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, and just, I think one of the ways of framing rebel wisdom is the sense that we are all going to have to go through shadow work as a culture because the nature of the media ecosystem. So you had, in the past, you had this sort of, you had the main channels, you had a very low resolution, you had gatekeeping, you had a kind of, we could all agree a narrative. There was a narrative that took us through probably from the end of the Second World War up until it started to fragment. And now it's really fragmenting under the kind of impact of alternative media, more viewpoints, which is a positive thing, but it's also deconstructive of that narrative. And it shows, so all the things, all the shadow material, like that we kind of were able to, keep out with the grand narrative we had that it never got into, we just gatekeep it out, to the, out of the media, is now coming up and leaking out of the track cracks because of the, the media revolution. Everyone has a voice. All of these perspectives that we were able to kind of say, no, that's, that's beyond the pale, there be monsters, is now coming up. So I don't see an alternative than actually doing that shadow work of looking at all the stuff we've repressed as a culture. I don't know what the fuck that looks like, but that seems to be what we're going to have to do. Right. But I think in order, because, you know, it is a question that I, I'm always wrestling with. So why can't we acknowledge the, the more uncomfortable parts of ourselves? Or why can't we acknowledge often that that thing we hate in other people is the unacknowledged in ourselves? A lot of the time, not always. But, you know, I, I'm in the habit now of when I really can't stand someone and there isn't really anything reasonable as to why I can't stand this person. I'm like, what You're gonna name any names? <laughs> well, no, you know what we want, no, actually right, not right now, uh, maybe next time. Um, but I often think, okay, so what is this person saying about me? What is the similarity here that I don't like looking at in myself? You know, because when I think I have a very um, visceral reaction to someone that isn't necessarily fair, I know that they are 
I mean, even if I'm not always conscious of it in the moment, and I could still maybe um, act in ways that are not my ideal towards that person, but very quickly I recognize I did this or I may have behaved in this way that was unfair because they represent a part of myself that I'm not comfortable with yet. They represent a part of myself that I'm still judging. Um, and I find that in most cases when I am losing my temper with people. Um, yeah, and we, we do kind of, we've run workshops and retreats and we do kind of shadow work within that. And one of the things is like shadow work is not when you don't like someone, it's when you have a visceral, intense reaction. That's the way to, to know whether it's shadow material. If you find yourself in that position, there's almost certainly something that you have either ignored about yourself or that you're seeing reflected or in some way, like there's a learning experience there. This is what I find so interesting though about the, the, so, the social script around activism, that when we become, well, become an activist or just start doing campaigning, you know, you, you're doing something with a group of friends or you join an organization or you join a movement that's swelling up um, or you, you know, join a sort of hashtag thing that's going on online. There's a sort of script that we unconsciously adopt um, that is all about, well, the problem is somewhere else. And that absolutely gets in the way of doing what you're talking about. Right. Because instantly, as soon as we're looking at, oh, well, the problem's out there. And, it, and you sort of have to, because you do have to describe the problem. Um, you're not looking at yourself. And uh, I lied to this, and I wonder whether you, you didn't touch on it in your talk, but the culture of a lot of activist organizations can often reflect that. Like, I won't name any names, but I know a lot of friends who are in activist organizations, and they're incredibly dysfunctional. The way they treat people is often terrible, and often because they've got this kind of idealist, idealism and drive, some of the interpersonal dynamics are absolutely shocking. Like, I know a lot of people who are burnt out because of it. And that, that's, the that's exactly the shadow. It's like this saviour mindset. No, we're all doing this wonderful thing together, but actually pay attention to the way you're treating that person, to the relationships that you have in your, in, in your organisation. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, the broader context to this is that this stuff goes on everywhere. People treat each other badly in every industry in every workplace, in every family. You know, stuff goes on every way, everywhere. We remark upon it when it happens in social change and for the good organisations because we're, you know, we're primed to look for the hypocrisy. So, so that's one bit of it. But yes, the, the narrative that we have to be good in order to do this stuff, it totally gets in the way. People sort of hold themselves up and say we're good and it stops the self-reflection. And, and then when that stuff is in shadow it's more likely to erupt up in uncontrolled ways, yeah. which is why it would be better to acknowledge our capacity for bad stuff. It's in all of us. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely in all of us. This is, this is why I'm interested in activism as the challenge of being human, because the challenge of being human, and you know, this predates social media, the challenge of being human is to learn to become whole, to accept the bits of ourselves that we've put away so that we're not reacting to other people, so that we can engage in the world in a more into subjective way where we are sort of made by our relations with other people rather than constantly having to win every interaction we're in, which arguably is the norm at the moment. You know, yeah, and, and as you say that about whole, and I remember an, another Jung quote, you know, and he said, I'd rather be whole than good. And I think that's a really important thing to, to consider what that means, to be rather be whole than good. And I believe that is to... Um, accept the um, or embrace the totality of the, the 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 spectrum of emotions and feelings and I uh, one of the reasons why I believe that we can't do this is because when we're thinking we assign value judgments to our thoughts so we think in terms of good and bad and I think that's unhelpful I think people should think in terms of at least when they're analyzing themselves only in terms of constructive and what's destructive. Because constructive and destructive, I don't think are value judgments, you know? So you can acknowledge something might be destructive, maybe like smoking, without feeling like, you know, it, saying maybe smoking is destructive is a lot easier than saying, I'm a bad person because I smoke, you know? That is not gonna allow you to engage with the problem in a sufficient way. But I think instead, if we abandon at least in our thoughts when we're thinking of ourselves, I think it would be a lot more easier to, to recognize that we have these 
rough textures, if you like. And they don't make us terrible people. I think they make us human, you know? I think maybe we're, we're terrible, not terrible people, I wouldn't even go that far. I think, you know, people are very questionable when they acknowledge these things and they don't do anything about them. But I think as long as we're making a conscious effort, I think that's all we can do. Um, but I think our idea of what, I think the idea of what it, the I, our idea of being a good person, I think stops us from being better people. I think it's like that. I had a question for you actually from something that you um, said when you spoke and it was about certainty. Um, because I've been really noticing the way that part of the activist script that we unconsciously take on is what we have to be certain about things. Because when you're up against the absolutely implicit certainty of those who are running the system, like I just can't tell you how many conversations I've had with men in suits, who in fact one of them actually said to me, if you were an economist, Anthea, you would know that what you are proposing is simply not possible. Well, it's now law in 80 countries, so they don't always know. But you're up against this, well, of course we're right and we don't have to be questioned. So we take on this, although you have to sound very certainty, and that can become very easily an over-certainty. Right, so I was completely. To speak to that. I mean, it's so funny. I've been, I've been, I haven't formulated these ideas properly yet, but I've been thinking about how so much of what we... So many people are considered intelligent over, you know, noted people, and I believe the key ingredient is doubt. You know, I think, you know, and it's, and it's a balance. It's a really, really fine balance, because I would say that I am someone where self-doubt can cripple me to an unhelpful degree. However, self-doubt, I think, is also the reason I believe if, if anyone finds anything interesting that I have to say, it's only because I doubt. You know, I doubt my own ideas sometimes, and I try to argue it and wrestle with them. I try to, if I think I have a good idea, I then immediately think, what is wrong about this idea? You know, uh, because I know I have blind spots. You know, I know my own intellectual oversights. Um, and so I think doubt is actually how we strengthen our thinking, you know, and it doesn't mean that we have to become so neurotic that, you know, we, we can't have a thought because we don't know if it means this or that. So I don't, I don't mean being neurotic and self-obsessed, but there is a point of doubt, and maybe the difficult thing about all life is that it's finding that sweet spot of balance you know, which I don't think I have, <laughs> you know, so I, I can't say that I've reached it and I'm, I'm speaking from the promised land, I'm not. I'm, I'm speaking from the trenches of someone who's trying to adopt this. Um, but yeah, I think being okay to doubt your own ideas and doubt what you're being told, you know, isn't that what it is to be a skeptic, you know, or to be, you know, to, to doubt, you know, to question. So yeah, I think doubt is a, a major ingredient for many of the world's best thinkers I think of people who are not afraid to doubt some of their best ideas, what they think are their best ideas. I like this idea of a sweet spot on these, these tricky kind of balances between being clear enough and doubting enough. There was another one I came up with in looking at how activists sort of recreate what they're trying to um, solve, which is this idea of starting with ourselves. So many uh, people who are trying to change the world, they're, they're either in savior mode or they're so driven by the kind of the power of their own sort of narrative and anger about the difficulty of the situation that you're starting with yourself in a way that gets in the way of being heard because people hear the righteousness, they hear the saviorism. Um, and so, we need to not do those things. But in order to not do those things, we actually have to attend to our own stuff. We've got to stop kind of like looking out there and saying the problem's over there. We do need to look at ourselves. So in order to not start with ourselves, we kind of do need to do a bit of starting with ourselves. And, and I think the problem right now, so then, but why aren't people starting with themselves? Because that's what that makes me think about. Because I'm always thinking, yeah, I have the same thought process. Why aren't we exploring ourselves? Well, how can we? We're distracted. What are we distracted by? Our phones. If not our phones, the emails, the messages, the texts, you know, all of these kinds of things. We have smartphones, which means even when we're not in work hours, we're expected to be reachable. You know, so, and then not on top of that, people have children, people have all of these responsibilities and obligations. Maybe the only reason as to why I've thought about some of these things, I don't have some of those responsibilities. I don't have children, you know, I'm not married. I don't have certain obligations. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the most outgoing. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time thinking by myself. Um, but that's not something that everyone 
this life affords. And so I think we actually, which is why I took a picture of this thing over here about how to be idle, the manifesto, because uh, I was looking at it and it was interesting to me because I think actually if we do want to think and if we do want to be able to um, be self-reflective so we can understand other people, so we can be more compassionate and so we can change people's minds, you know, if possible, is to cultivate boredom. You know, I think we need to be cultivate the time to be bored where we don't fill it with our phones. So we need to be conscious of the times where we're not really doing anything and let's be aware of how much we feel that we need to reach for our phone then. And if we can, let's just try not to. So we can cultivate the state of boredom again and just start thinking. I think one of the other things that um, stops us looking at ourselves, I think this brings us into the other area that I really wanted to talk about with you, is the, the, the lack of meaning in our culture. I think one of the things, we don't want to sit still and be with ourselves because we might realise that there's a bit of a void that we're filling with the things we've been told to fill it with, with social media, with consumerism, with kind of being on the treadmill in all sorts of ways, whether it's, whether it's work or not. And, and that brings me to the question of, of spirituality and, and a sort of a spiritual disposition. Um, yes, yeah, so, okay, so, you know, uh, spirituality, you know, the big S word. I call it an S word sometimes because depending on the circle you're in, that word can go very different, you know? That word can mean all types of things. It can mean that you're not credible. It can mean maybe you smoke too much weed. I mean, for some people, it means all sorts. Um, but no, for me... So, with, you know, when I think about spirituality, so beyond uh, concepts like, I don't know, the third eye and chakras and all of this and all of that, um, I just see it as the removal of that which is false, fundamentally, you know, is the attempt to remove that which is false in ourselves, in our external worlds, in our relationships, in our families. And I think when we remove that which is false, whether it's interests, some of our interests aren't genuine, some of our interests are based on what we think we should do, based on our race, based on our gender, based on our sexuality, based on our idea of a good person, you know? And, and these things are false, and they um, stop us from um, confronting who we are. And I think when we can't deal with who other people are, I think it's often because we haven't dealt with ourselves. Um, and so I might have lost where I was going, I can go off on tangents. Um, but yeah, I think you guys get what I'm saying. I feel like the, um, the question of spirituality comes up for me in our, these questions about how we, how we change the world because another way of thinking about it is it's about how we are in relation to everyone and everything. You know, we can talk about non-human beings as well who is not us. Um, and if the basis of our relation to everyone who is not us is superiority whether that's we're dominating nature or whether we have to win in every interaction we're in through feeling righteous and being better or being pure or whatever it is, then that's going to get in the way of, of being in the fullness of ourselves yeah, yeah. as opposed to the alternative, which is to relate in a much more intersubjective way, which right. means we're kind of, we recognise... We recognise the connection. We recognise that we're all made by each other, ultimately. And I, and I, sorry, I've now brought myself back from the tangent yeah. now I, I remember what you were saying and so yeah I do think you know part of the issue is that many of us don't have a connection to something transcendent something beyond the material um, and I think when we don't have um, a connection uh, to something transcendent we start becoming religious about our beliefs you know, and, and that's when we get dogmatic and that's when we become um, very binary thinkers you know we're encouraging non-binariness in everywhere but our thinking you know, and this is the most important place uh, where we need to be. Um, and so, yeah, I think spirituality is the thing that grounds you. And we need a lot to ground us because everything is trying to pull us in, in every direction. Um, and so, again, spirituality for me, maybe I think the reason why I think it can be off-putting to people is because people think it has to do with religion or some kind of faith or, or meditation or things that sound very airy-fairy. And I don't think it has to do with any of that. I, I think it's just about, you know, most of the most spiritual people I know don't even know spiritual concepts. You know, this is an embodiment. It's an embodiment for me. It's not, I don't even know many spiritual concepts myself, but I would say fundamentally, I, I have a spiritual framework, you know, and, and that's just being prepared to not, to try and see people in their full humanity. I think that's even spiritual work. Yeah, I love that. The spirituality is burning off that which is false. 
Um, and we were, Ali and I were talking of before about maybe a new tagline for, so th there's various forms of that. There's, there's kind of, we're obviously a media company, we do uh, retreats, and we also write really based in practices. There's practices like authentic relating, circling, and dialogue practices, and how you engage in those dialogue practices that we kind of learned when we were, when we were uh, learning to do counseling. And counseling is all about the transformative power of truth. Carl Rogers, who was the sort of founder of person-centered counseling, saw it as just a truthful exchange between two people is by its very nature transformative. It is transformative, it is therapeutic. Like truth is something that in itself is, is therapeutic. And so we've always had this sort of real link into practice. Can we, can we start doing these practices? Can we bring that into our lives in, in a one-to-one -one way and kind of build relationships built on those. I think this maybe ties into your activism point. It's like, unless we can actually build those relationships with the people around us, then anything we're trying to do to change the bigger system is going to get caught up because we're living in authentically. We're living in authentic lives. We're not authentic to who we are. We're not authentic, authentic towards who everyone else is. So therefore, is that kind of the generator of the problem? Or part of it? I think it's part of it. I think this idea of practice is really interesting because one of the things I've been interested in is the absolute frequency of people burning out as activists. You talk to anyone who's trying to do it and they will talk about burnout. And there's a really common pattern where you, you get kind of motivated, you see that what's wrong with a particular problem, you dive into action, you really go for it. I mean, a few years later, you haven't won, and you're like, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't fit this in with my life. I've got kids. I can't, I can't do it. And, and you burn out and stop, and some people go through that cycle repeatedly. And one of the things I was doing in my research of talking to other campaigners is I really wanted to talk to people who've been doing it for decades and say, how are you doing this? How are you keeping going? Um, and Satish Kumar, who's been going since the 1950s, he walked around the world in the 1950s with no money to visit all the capitals of the nuclear powers to talk about nuclear disarmament, and he's been going ever since. I said, how do you keep going? And he said, well, look, you don't eat a meal and expect never to have to eat again. You don't shower in the morning and expect not to have to shower the, other, the next day. There are things that you have to do every day because they're part of living. This is this idea of, of activism as a practice and not this franticness of trying to go for the goal. And again, there's a balance, there's a sweet spot. Because of course, if you're doing it, you do have a goal. Of course, you're doing it for a purpose. You're doing it because you're worried about something and there are things to be worried about. And yet, doing it as a practice takes some of that franticness off. But in order to do that, I think you do have to look at your own motivations. Because if you're being driven by your anger at something else, which a lot of us are, if you're trying to placate your own needs for status and involvement and meaning, then that urgency comes across in the drive in which you kind of throw yourself at the problem and you lose that sense of practice that, is, you know, that, that really relates it to spiritual practice. So we're into the last couple of minutes. Ayesha, was there anything else you wanted to say? Yeah, no, um, I, I found what you were just saying there, Anthea, really um, interesting and important, you know? I mean, even in my own life, in the stages that I was anti-everything, and believe me, I've been everywhere um, in that kind of world. And, you know, a lot of it, when I'm honest with myself, was, I mean, I was driven to that because I couldn't handle the chaos inside of myself. And I think a lot of people use um, activism as a way of avoiding themselves, avoiding a lot of pain that's there. Um, and I think, you know, maybe our idea of activism is too grandiose, you know, it's too external. I think, you know, you can be an activist just in a room with one person. It's how you decide to talk to them. It's how you decide to, to think about them or, and things like that. Um, it's just, you know, it's not making assumptions. It, it's not assuming that someone's money, race, or whatever it may be, means this and that. I think those are all forms of activism, but we only like the kind that can be easily retweeted, or you know, the kind that brings a lot of followers. The stuff that happens behind closed doors between the people that mean the most to us. You know, like we're not we're not as conscious about how we could be activists there. So I would say that. No, activism is best practice in the subtle ways, is in the everyday, is in the mundane. So we have reached time. 
And all of our guests will be back in about half an hour for a Q&A panel discussion. Uh, we are Rebel Wisdom. This conversation was a fantastic example of what we're really trying to do, which is to bring a sort of deeper level of kind of understanding of psychology, of emotional drivers, like what is really driving us at a deeper level, and apply that to sort of cultural topics. So I'd like to thank Aisha and Anthea for this amazing conversation. And... Thank you. We will transition now to psychedelics. <laughs>